and hello. So in this lecture, we're beginning the process of uh, reading through the text of Jeremiah. Um, again, what we are wanting to do, what we're attempting to do here, is what's called a close reading of the text. This is part of a very significant and central part of the exegetical process. This is where we're working through slowly, carefully, paying attention to all of the details, uh, making observations, and then hopefully through that being able to um, discern and, and draw out meaning from the text. Okay, so we have a few different things we're going to be doing, um, but the very first thing that I want you to do, um, this is a task that you'll be uh, sharing this information in the discussion forum, um, I want you to read through the entire first chapter of Jeremiah carefully. And when you do that, uh, what I want you to do is to create an outline. Um, let me show you what I'm meaning here. So by an outline, I'm meaning you start with like Roman numeral one, and you might, uh, you know, refer to the introduction, whoops, intro, and then this is going to be verses one through so I'm just giving you kind of a start here, verses 1 through 3. And then work through the rest of the chapter. And, you know, you might have subpoints A, you know, even a subpoint under that, 1, 2, and then back to B. Work through, create your own outline for the chapter, uh, putting together, you know, this introductory, these introductory verses, the first three verses, and then, you know, God calling to Jeremiah, these visions that he has. Um, how would you structure, how would you organize this? This is not something um, to say that there is only one right answer. There's a, a couple possible ways that one might be able to take this, uh, and I want to see how you you know, put this information together as you're paying attention to close details, okay? So at this point, go ahead, pause the video, work on your own introduction. All right, so now, You've had a chance to do that. Hopefully you have a, a fairly strong sense of the structure of this first chapter, um, generally referred to just as the call or the commissioning of Jeremiah. Um, you'll uh, Hopefully you will have had a chance to take a look at the extra reading that you were supposed to be doing uh, for uh, this week. This is where you're reading the article and the dictionary of the Old Testament uh, Prophets volume. This is uh, put out by IVP, sometimes called the IVP Black Bible Dictionary series, uh, because they have a whole set like series of these on you know Pentateuch, historical books, prophets, and then of course in the New Testament, Jesus, you know the Gospels and um, all of those. So there, it's very well done. It's a good source, uh, and it'll give you a sense of how call or commission narratives are used across the prophets, because there's a few of them, uh, and it's it's an interesting and I think a fruitful thing to analyze them as a whole, understand the structure and the form, just as we learned about uh, you know forms of prophetic literature, forms of prophetic speech. There's also um, uh, you know, a lot to be gained by studying the form of these call narratives. So hopefully you, you have done that as well. All right. So now, um, beginning in Jeremiah, let's just take this first section here, uh, verses 1 to 3. This is sometimes called a superscription or just, a, you know, the introduction to the prophetic book. Most prophetic books have something like this, uh, although this is a pretty long one. This is, you know, there's quite a bit more information here than is, is typical. So as, you know, just to compare, um, we can say in Isaiah 1, here it is, just the one verse, the vision of Isaiah, son of Amos, concerning Judah and Jerusalem. And, you know, so we have the name of the prophet, you know, some identification, the son of, um, what it's about, it's concerning Judah and Jerusalem, so he's a prophet to the south, 
And then it gives us the time frame during the reigns of these kings who were kings of Judah. So that's that's one example. Um, we have uh, we can just go back to Jeremiah. And so here we have three verses, uh, quite a bit more information within these. Um, so we have the words of Jeremiah, son of Hilkiah. So there we go. The identification of who this is. Um, of the priests who were in Anathoth and the land of Benjamin. So now this is giving us, you know, his hometown, where he's from, you know, a little bit more about his family. Like he was from a priestly lineage. I mean, this is, I mean, we have more biographical information about Jeremiah than any of the other prophets. Um, and this is going to play out a lot throughout the book. So we have, you know, okay, here's the person. A little bit about his family. Um, Anathoth is um, a town that is the, the exact location. I don't think has has um, there's a consensus on that, but the region, the area that it is is in, is pretty well understood. This is um, very close to Jerusalem. Like he didn't Jeremiah did not grow up within Jerusalem, but. He, uh, he probably could see the walls of Jerusalem from his hometown. It was it was that close. Um, probably just on the north, just a little bit to the um, to the east of where Jerusalem was. Now, information like that you can easily find by looking in a Bible dictionary. Um, so there are uh, some Bible dictionaries that are available to you through North Central's library. If you are looking to build your own like personal reference library, uh, there's a lot of great options. You can get some that are just one volume. If you really want to invest, you can uh, get the Anchor Bible Dictionary or Anchor Yale Bible Dictionary. It is um, just a gold mine of information, and you can look up anything like that. You can look up Anathoth and you know find out where it's at. You know the places that's mentioned in the Bible and its significance. So here we have, okay, basic information. Jeremiah. Um, some personal identification, and we keep going down into the second verse, to whom the the word of the Lord came uh, in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, in the 13th year of his reign. Okay, so here's this, this emphasis. So this is going to come up a lot in Jeremiah. The word of the Lord came. We talked a little bit about the messenger formula, the, you know, thus says the Lord, that kind of thing, or, you know, an indication of speech that has its origin in God. It's not surprising we would see that reflected here, even within the superscription. Um, and then it tells us, you know, when, during what reign. It came during the days of Josiah, uh, you know, who he was, king of Judah, uh, in the 13th year of his reign. So, if you recall, uh, Josiah was king. Um, he started his reign in 640. So, 13 years later, we're down in 627. Okay, so 627 is where we are here um, when the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. But then look what happens in verse 3. This is a little bit different. I just want you to catch this. This is, um, we could maybe say this is a seam within the fabric of the text. It came also in the days of Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, king of Judah, until the 11th year of Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, until the exile of Jerusalem in the fifth month. Okay, so... Jeremiah's, uh, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah in this year, 627, and then it's going to go all the way down to the year, whoops, 587, or 586. The, the year of the exile is sometimes dated 587, 586. That's not something you really need to concern yourself with the purpose of this course, You'll see both dates fairly regularly. But notice this scene that we originally saw here. Because you have the word of the Lord came in, to, in the days of Josiah. 
why not just say the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah and in the days of uh, Jehoiakim and in the days of Zedekiah, much like we saw when we looked at, um, see if I can go straight back here, like we saw in the beginning of Isaiah. He saw, you know, this vision of Isaiah came during the reigns of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. It's just listed all together. Well, an introduction like this, one thing to keep in mind is that this is, um, this is an editorial edition. The prophet himself did not write these words. Whoever compiled the words of the prophet, um, and very often, like in its final form, this introductory section, the superscription to the prophet, um, would have been added by an editor. But perhaps we have actually two superscriptions that were merged together. I kind of think that that's what's happening. Now, of course, when we talk about this, we're not talking about things that we can prove. We can notice details, and then we try to figure out, well, what's the best explanation for these sorts of details within the text? I think probably the best explanation is you had an original introduction, uh, you know, superscription, and then that was expanded. Um, it also came during these times. Now, perhaps this first introduction was only referring to specifically the call narrative, which is going to happen. And then the second introduction was kind of the rest of the prophecies, possibly. I'm not, not entirely sure on that. That's, that becomes much more highly speculative. Um, but just to notice the detail, notice that it seems like there's a seam in the fabric at this point. Um, I should just mention, this is talking about Hilkiah. This is mentioned here in the text. Um, Hilkiah um, was the name of the priest who found the book of the law during the, clean, the cleaning of the temple um, that we read about in Kings. We reference this in, in uh, the historical context uh, lecture. Probably this is not the same person. For one, he wasn't a priest in Jerusalem. He was a priest in a city near Jerusalem. Uh, but two, there's not really anything to indicate that this is, in fact, the same person. Um, it's just ha they happen to share the same name. You know, just because you read about two different people uh, named, named Tom who do something, that doesn't mean that Tom did both things. It could just be two different Toms. It's, that's just a reality. Um, but... It sometimes is suggested and brought up, um, but it is worth noting that Jeremiah was himself of a priestly background. Okay, so now, um, oh, something else I should notice, um, just as we're reading through these first three verses, trying to make these notes um, and, and uh, have these observations. Did you see who's not included within the kings? You have Josiah, right? Um, you have Josiah, and then you have Jehoiakim, and then you have Zedekiah. But there's two, sorry, used to my camera, uh, there's two that are missing, right? Why do you think that is? And th these are the questions that you, you should be learning how to ask. Why, why are two particular kings missing? Uh, well, Jehoahaz, the king who was, um, he was king right after Josiah, if you remember, he was only king for three months. And then the next one, Jehoiakim, was again only king for three months. So they were just skipped probably just because their reigns were not really of any significance. It was so short and brief, um, and then they were taken away into exile. So that's probably, that's probably why. Now, we get into verse 4, more the substance of this, okay? By the way, um, the, the program that I'm using here, we'll see, just see how it goes as we go through this course. I've never really put together lectures like this. This is a Bible program. It's called Accordance, a Bible software program called Accordance. Um, I use it quite a bit. 
Um, if you are going into vocational ministry or going into biblical studies more as a profession, at some point you might want to think about getting your own Bible software program. Um, there are a couple options, and um, they're not too expensive to start out, but if you do invest in a lot of resources, it can become quite expensive. I happen to have a lot of my personal resources um, as a teacher uh, in accordance because I'm able to move because we serve overseas and we're able to uh, you know it's a lot cheaper to just to bring a computer over than it is to bring over you know boxes and boxes full of books so I use it quite a bit um, but just in case you're wondering I'm just it's a convenient way to display the text if you do know Hebrew I do have it up there on the side that's more just reference for myself so that I would be able to um, if I want to make a reference to a particular term in Hebrew I have it right there and then I'm able to just hover over the words and it you know highlights it for you so you can see what I'm talking about so that's that's what we're using here but now beginning in verse 4 we have the call narrative itself okay uh, and this is looking to me like a discourse marker okay it's a phrase that um you know it's it's uh, it's introducing a new section right it's it's like it's a clue for us like okay now we're beginning a new section so hopefully when you made your outline you noticed that something new happened in verse four now the word of lord came to me saying Boy, that sounds a lot like what we just read earlier in verse 2, right? What, what do we see in verse 2? To whom the word of the Lord came. Okay, and then down here. The, now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, and this is, you know, what God said. But then if we look even further, this same discourse marker uh, occurs again down in verse 11. And the word of the Lord came to me, saying. And then we see it once more. And the word of the Lord came to me a second time, saying. So all of these, it functions as a sort of discourse marker. It's introducing a new section. Okay, This is not too abnormal, just within the context of the prophets. Um, but that's what we see there. Okay, so this first one. Let me scroll back up. Okay, verse 4. Now the word of the Lord came to me saying, uh, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, and before you were born, I consecrated you. I have appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Um, this is... Um, Well, let, let me back up just, just for one moment here. Um, within your your reading of types of calling and commissioning narratives of prophets, um, it has been noticed that there are two primary types. If I remember right, it was this is going back to Sigmund Movinkel who made this observation. Um, it has been observed a uh, 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 wolf. Old Testament prophet who wrote a tremendous commentary on Ezekiel did a great analysis of um, of calling narratives of prophets and he he also uh, identified he said there's two primary types there's some some call narratives that focus on a visionary element and some call narratives focus more on the giving of the divine word to the prophet now, when you read through this, we've already kind of noticed our discourse marker. Which do you think it would be? Would it be this is a you know a call narrative focusing on the visionary, or a call narrative focusing on this giving of the divine word? So, um, I, I like to make comparisons with with the Book of Isaiah because it's it's just ripe for comparison. But you notice the the. Uh, introduction the superscription in isaiah began the vision which isaiah saw okay it's a vision which he saw and then look at his call narrative in chapter six i mean 
that is absolutely a focus on the visionary element. I mean, he sees God exalted in his glory. He sees seraphim flying around. They're, you know, they're covering themselves with their wings. They're crying out one to another, holy, holy. The, the whole foundations of the, tremble, of the temples, they're trembling and shaking like it's an earthquake. Everything's filled with smoke. Um, I mean, that is a dramatic vision that the prophet has. Jeremiah... He has, it's the word of the Lord came to him. Again, the word of the Lord came to him. The word of the Lord came to him. His is much more focused on this is the giving of the divine word to the prophet. Um, so in that, in that sense, it's different. Um, there's actually quite a bit of comparison can be done between the calling of Jeremiah and the calling of Moses. Uh, Moses, you know, calling narrative, commissioning narrative, um, in Ex- beginning in Exodus chapter three, is quite similar. Actually, there's there's been some studies noticing like similar phrases and terms that are being used uh, within the two. And what Moses sees, like he sees something, it's significant. It's a bush that's that's on fire, but it's not being consumed. You know, that gets his attention. Um, but it's not the same as like the big dramatic heavenly scene. Um, you know, seeing a bush is an ordinary thing. Seeing a bush on fire, well, that's not that ordinary. The thing that was extraordinary was the fact that it wasn't burnt up. But it still probably fits within that that category of of call narrative that the focus is more on the divine word. Uh, and there's some elements that are expected within this. You know, there's the the um, you know, the introductory word of of the call narrative, you know, the introductory word of, of God calling the prophet and the commissioning of the prophet. These are typical elements that we expect to find. We also expect to find very typically an objection. Um, that, I mean, that's kind of a standard part of a call narrative. Um, we sometimes read a bit too much into the objection by saying, well, the the prophet, you know, lacked faith or the person lacked faith. Uh, I don't think it's quite like that. Uh, I think it's actually the objection comes because they're part of a Middle Eastern, you know, honor, shame culture uh, where, you know, you would you would expect some sort of natural expression of humility within the culture um, that when God says I've called you that they wouldn't just immediately say well you've got the right man for the job I'm up for it it's it probably was like whoa you know just little old me like you know maybe I'm too young or I don't know how to speak or you know things objections like that are are pretty typical and then God graciously reassures them and says, no, no, I, I've not made a mistake. I have indeed called you and I'm, you know, bring, I've called you for this purpose. Uh, and so we'll see how that plays out here. But right here, verse five, sorry, getting a little ahead of myself. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I consecrated. I've pointed you as a prophet to the nations. I mean, there's some big theological words that are happening right here. Before I formed you, I knew you before you were born. I consecrated you. I have appointed you. Okay. Um, I want to introduce just a little bit of how you might do a further investigation on a term like this if you find it to be significant. So let's see if this works. Okay, good. Getting used to the technology. Okay. So, um, in uh, this is a website called Blue Letter Bible. Uh, I can certainly do this within the Bible software program that I'm using. I'm doing it on here because this is something that is free to you. You can access. Um, it's not the most sophisticated, but it gets the job done, right? Um, so here we have. I just have pulled up Jeremiah one, uh, just in a you know fairly. Um, you know, literal translation. I don't like the word literal, but you know what I mean. Uh, New American Standard Bible translation, which is what I'm mostly going to be reading from as we go through this course. Uh, so um, within this, oh, I got to do it over here. Okay. So within this, we get down to verse 
five before I formed you in the womb I knew you okay and we're gonna click on the tools button right there now when I click on that you'll see it gives you it pulls down the Hebrew text and then it pulls down below that um, it gives you the Strong's number the Strong's number is referring to the Hebrew word each word that's used within so this is kind of like an interlinear so you have the Hebrew word how that word is translated here it's translated in the KJV that's okay we're not really too concerned about that but I, what I want to do is I want to investigate the word formed let me make sure this is looking right okay yeah the word formed here um, if you don't know Strong's numbers what Strong's numbers is as there was this guy I don't know, 19, uh, 19th century, I think, he went through and made a list of every Hebrew word that occurs within the Old Testament, um, put them all in alphabetical order, and gave them a number. Number one, number two, number three, etc. All the way down through. Um, that numbering system became a convenient way of referring to the word, especially if you didn't know Hebrew. This word, Yatsar, um, is... You know, if you can't read that, you can just say, well, I know it's number 3335. And he did the same thing for the New Testament. The numbering system isn't perfect. It's actually been replaced by it. There's a newer updated numbering system that's more accurate. But it gets the job done, at least for our purposes here. So when we do a word study, here's what we most the most valuable thing that we can do is we want to find out where does this word Yatsar occur elsewhere in the Old Testament. How is this word used in other places? So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to click on the Strong's number. Okay, now that's going to bring me to a new page here um, that has the Hebrew word at the top. It has the transliteration, so how you pronounce it using, you know, English letters and the pronunciation. Oh, wow, they even have something you can click on. You know, some basic information. Most of the stuff, um, you know, if you need to refer to the word, especially in writing a paper, you can use the transliteration. If you know how to type in Hebrew, that's perfectly fine too, but you can just use the transliteration. And then you go down through most of this information, I'm going to say just skip. Don't worry about this. You know, here's the different ways that the KJV translates the word. It's translated as form 26 times, potter, you know, etc. You can kind of go through those. Um, the Strong's definition that is really not very useful because it's so out of date and everything there here is a lexical entry that's again a bit out of date but it is um i think a little bit more helpful the the brown driver briggs lexicon um again it's an older one not not the best resource but you could do worse but we are continuing to scroll down and down and this is what is the most valuable, the concordance results um, using the NASB uh, text. So in other words, um, what this is saying is they take the text of, a, the, in this case, the New American Standard Bible, and they're searching through the Hebrew text that stands behind this English translation. And looking through and saying, where does this term, Yetzar, occur throughout the entire of the Hebrew text? This is very different than saying, where else does the word formed? You know, here it is in Genesis 2-7, the Lord God formed the man of the dust. I'm not interested in where else the word formed occurs. I'm interested in where else the Hebrew term, Yetzar, occurs. So, this happens to occur a fair number of times 63 times across 56 different verses you can scroll through and you can read through all of these it gives you a good overall sense of how the word is being used um i do notice there's this um you know there's this element of creation with this you know the fact that it occurs in the creation narrative um you know the lord god formed the man of the dust of the ground um, you know, again, the next verse, you know, there he, in the Garden of Eden, he placed the man whom he had formed. It's, it's again, that word, Yetzar. Um, 
And here again, man, 219, out of the ground, the Lord God formed every animal of the field and bird of the sky. So this is really a word that's that's being used of creation, but not just in terms of creation. You can also um, uh, look through here. You know what? Sorry, it's been a little while since I've been on this website. I'm actually looking. Um, when I said that it is searching through the Hebrew text that stands behind the New American Standard, that's actually not accurate. This is actually a little bit better. Um, they are searching for the term for the they're searching for this Strong's number within what's called the WLC Hebrew, um, the Westminster Leningrad Codex. Our Hebrew text is Hebrew Old Testament is based on a manuscript that's called, referred to as the uh, Leningrad Codex. When we say the Westminster Leningrad Codex, we're just referring to when that codex was was put into a digital form. So it's the WLC Hebrew. So they're actually, this is good. They're searching through the Westminster Leningrad Codex, um, which is a good place to start. If you take Hebrew, probably more like advanced Hebrew, you'll learn more about the text critical issues that surround uh, something like that. But now let's keep scrolling down because um, what I want to get to, a good place to start. So now we're, you know, we're here in Isaiah 29, 16, Isaiah 30, 14. A good place to start in doing a word study, especially when you have a longer book like Jeremiah. Okay, here we go. We finally get to the occurrence in our verse, Jeremiah 1, 5. A good thing to do is to look through and see how a term is used within the book that you are studying. So what I'm interested in now, like one of the first things I want to know is, how is Yetzar being used within the text of Jeremiah? Okay, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Um, here we have, okay, reference to God as he's the maker of everything. There's that sort of creation language to it. And then we have, oh, this is interesting. There's a lot of these within chapter 18. And what is the context of chapter 18? Oh, and again in chapter 19 too. Arise, go down to the potter's house. There's that word yetzar, but here it's translated as a potter. In other words, this is the one who does the forming. Well, now you might want to look at and say, well, let me read through that chapter because potter's house went down to the potter's house in the next verse. Um, verse 4, uh, okay, he was, uh, but the vessel that he was making of clay was spoiled in the hand of the potter, so he made it into another vessel as it pleased the, the pot. You know, this is all the reference to the one who's doing the forming. Um, man, and then, let's see, we get down to verse 11. So now, you know, he's made this observation of the potter. We'll get a chance to look at this text in depth more later. But now he says, behold, I am Yatsar, I am forming a disaster against you and devising a plan against you. So now it's, you know, the potter is doing the forming, and now God is saying, I'm the one doing the forming. And then again, some of this language is repeated in verse 19. Let me get back. All right. This type of investigation... Um, it helps us to connect related passages within the text of, you know, as you're doing an exegetical study of Jeremiah. There is this strong sense that, that God is the one who is forming people. You know, God is the creator. He forms man out of the dust of the ground. But then you also have um, this text later on in Jeremiah that talks about this potter who's forming. And this becomes sort of, uh, almost like a, like a parable, like this, you know, lesson of of how God is going to treat and how He's going to, in fact, form this. In in that case, a punishment against His people, and so you can kind of draw that connection. It's it's um, it's not uncommon that when you read something like a call narrative, that there would it would echo forward into later passages within the book of Jeremiah. Okay, moving right along. Um, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Uh, boy, even that term, before I formed you in the womb, 
I knew you. Here we have the term yada. Okay, would be written in English, something like that. Um, this is, again, a very significant term. Yada is, um, it's used to describe not just a knowledge that you have, like you go to school and you study math, but it's a knowledge that comes through a, a personal experience. It's a knowledge that comes through like a relationship, like to know someone. Actually, this is even used to describe, you know, uh, intimate relations between Adam and Eve. You know, it says that Adam knew his wife Eve. It's showing that sort of uh, familiarity. It's often used as a way to express God's relationship with his people, especially in the context of a covenant relationship. I knew you. When, when God would say, I know you, it's, it's a way of expressing like, I, I have a personal relationship with you. We are in a covenant relationship. Um, that would be another word. Man, you could look at that and see how that's used in, um, in other prophetic books to describe and to, you know, as a way of characterizing this covenant relationship. Man, I'm just looking at how, how slow this is taking. So I'm going to try to speed up a little bit. Um, but that's what, that's what close reading is. Close reading is like really slowing down, paying very close attention to details, not allowing anything to slip by you. Um, that's what we're trying to do here. Uh, when you look at this, at this, you know, you're, th you're doing things like close reading. You're also considering like the broader theological message. Um, the, the issue of predestination certainly does come up within Jeremiah. I mean, here you have this idea that, you know, before he was even born, God knew him. You know, God had this relation, like almost this covenant relationship with him. Before he was born, he was consecrated. He was appointed or set apart for, I mean, that's the idea. It's, it's like the, the concept of being holy. Um, kadosh is, you know, to, to be holy is God has consecrated Jeremiah for this particular task, set him apart for this purpose. Well, was there any free will on Jeremiah's part? Um, I mean, that's, that's a pretty big question, and you can explore that here. You can also explore it in chapter 18, uh, chapter 19, when you're reading through that, this, you know, description of Jeremiah at the potter's house, um, as worthy, you know, if you want to have that discussion, these are certainly relevant texts. Okay. But like I said, trying to move along. So we get down verse six, um, then I said, and here we have this objection, right? The, the, the protest that's very common in call narratives. Again, I think it reflects cultural mores more than it reflects um, a sincere objection, personally. Um, and he says, you know, I don't know how to speak because I am a youth. Um, I'm just, you know, I'm just a boy. Um, and then... Verse 7, the Lord said to me, do not say I am a youth. And here he gives him this reassurance. Um, do not say I'm a youth because everywhere I send you, you shall go. And all that you, I command you, you shall speak. Um, so here again, it's that emphasis that Jeremiah's ministry is going to be a ministry of words. And their words are going to be coming from Yahweh. They're coming from God. Um, and then he says, you know, because Jeremiah is like, you know, I, I don't, I'm just a boy. Don't send me. And he says, no, no, don't say that. Don't say I'm only a boy because I'll send you and you're going to go where I send you. And you're going to speak all that I command you. And then he says, don't be afraid. Verse eight, for I am with you to save you. So God is promising this divine presence is going to be with be with the prophet um, again this is similar to um, the promise of god's presence that he gives to moses you see the same thing happening there so that comparison can definitely be made um, and then we have this further overcoming the lord stretched out his hand touched my mouth 
The Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I have appointed you on this day over nations and over kingdoms to root down, to root out and to tear down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. So there's all these different things that are happening here. And you're going to see this language echoed again later in, you know, in the book of Jeremiah, um, to build, to, you know, to destroy and overthrow, to build and to plant. Um, So Jeremiah is overall like a pretty dark book. Um, Oh, that's like the overall sense of the book of Jeremiah. It's, it's pretty grim, but there are certainly some passages of hope um, because it's both those things. Like he is, I mean, he won the lottery. He got the lucky opportunity to be able to uh, announce the destruction of Jerusalem, the destruction of the temple, the exile of God's people, his judgment against them. But he also looks forward to the hope you know, that God has in store, the, you know, the plans of, um, of rebuilding, to build up something from those ashes. Uh, we see both of those things in Jeremiah. And honestly, I think that the, the passages of hope that we see in Jeremiah are some of the brightest that we see in the Old Testament, partly because it's surrounded by such dark, you know, words of judgment. I think you know, it makes it it makes the hope shine all the brighter. Uh, the fact that we see that there. Okay, again, moving right along. Now we get to okay, another one of these seams here. And the word of the Lord came to me saying, "Now, I sometimes wonder. You know, is are those like discourse markers? The word of the Lord came to me. The word of the Lord came to me. Um, is that coming from an editor?" perhaps, uh, an amanuensis, uh, you know, someone who's like, like Baruch seemed to have functioned, you know, taking down Jeremiah's dictation, um, which by the way, when taking down dictation, um, you sometimes have some of the flavor of the person taking down the dictation. I, I had to do this. I, when I was in seminary, I was a, uh, research assistant for a professor and sometimes he would ask me you know I'm working in his office and I was doing some other things for him too and sometimes he would ask me to help him you know write an email or something and you know he starts to talk and I'm just you know typing it out and then you know English actually wasn't his first language and so um, occasionally I would you know hear him kind of you know pause for a second you know trying to think through how to phrase something and I'd and I'd offer like well maybe like this and you know he'd say oh no no not like that and or sometimes he would say yeah yeah just write that um you definitely can have that coming through so just that's just a little side comment but um I do see this as again it's a seam in the fabric. The word of the Lord came to me saying, what do you see, Jeremiah? And now here we have one of the um, vision reports from the prophet, okay? Um, and again, this is the type of vision report that is, the focus is um, is not so much, it's, it's the oracle vision. It's not a focus on something dramatic and miraculous. It's a focus on something ordinary, but through that ordinary object, God is going to uh, reveal his word. Now, in this case, uh, he says, what do you see? And, he's, uh, and I said, I see a branch of an almond tree. Then the Lord said to me, you have seen well, for I am watching over my word to perform it. Now you read through that in the English, and it might seem a bit uh, confusing. What does an almond tree have to do with God watching over his word? Uh, And you would be very normal for asking that question. Um, because Because it is a bit odd when you first look at it. Let me try to switch over here. Um, okay, so you have the word uh, of an almond tree. Whoops. Okay, almond in Hebrew uh, is the word shakade.
Okay, it would be pronounced like this. Now, Hebrew originally would have been written without vowels. Vowels were added at a much later time, uh, maybe beginning in you know the fourth century or so of the Common Era after Jesus. Okay, that's when you started to get the vowels. You just would have the consonants written like this, and then you also have the almond tree is equated with the word watching. And the word watching is the same Hebrew letters, consonants. But then when you add in the vowels for almond, you have shockade. But for watching, you have shockade. Okay, so hopefully you see how that is. It's really just a play on words. Um, I've heard it read. I'm I'm no botanist, but that an almond tree would have been one of the first to blossom, uh, and so it was like it was like a watching tree. It was watching for the spring, I guess. Uh, so that's kind of why it would have that name. Um, okay, sure, I'll take. I'll take people's advice on that. But I see the play on words that's happening here. You know, Jeremiah, what do you see? I see a shockade. You've done well that you say you see a shockade because I am shockade. I am watching over my word to perform it. So um, this begs a question, I think. Um, what word exactly is it that God is watching over to perform? Right? Like what like what's the word that God's watching over? Um, I think given this vision's, you know, position, location, um, here in the beginning, uh, you know, and, and here's the question. Is this vision part of the call narrative itself? You know, like you know, you you had the beginning call narrative, beginning in verse four and going on through verse 10, that's the start of it. And so hopefully you're working through this in your outline, but now you have, you know, verse 11, is this also part of the call narrative? Did this happen at the same time? Or did this happen at a later time that Jeremiah knew was was part of the same basic call narrative? Or, I mean, these are questions worth asking, but if you take this to be part of the call narrative itself, then, okay, you're looking at something that's introducing the entirety of Jeremiah's ministry. And Jeremiah's ministry was largely, you know, predicting the the destruction of Judah, Jerusalem, um, the exile of the people. And so the word which he's watching over is the word of judgment, because God has been issuing these warnings through other prophets for hundreds of years. Um, you know, going all the way back to the to the covenant at Sinai, that it was the if you do not obey, if you do not follow the stipulations of the covenant, God's going to punish, and that's kind of what he's. I think he's watching over. He says, "Okay, I'm watching over my word. I haven't forgotten about it, and I'm getting ready to perform it." Okay, and then we get. Let's see. All right. Okay. So now we get back over to uh, our text here. And then verse 13, the word of the Lord came to me a second time saying, what do you see? Okay. Now he sees a boiling pot facing away from the north. Okay. So here's, you know, the, the boiling pot, you know, it's, it's tipped over. And the direction it's like it's flow like whatever's inside the pot is flowing southward now, um, but northward is you know that's kind of the back end that's where it's coming from, and God says okay, out of the north verse fourteen the Lord said to me out of the north the evil will be unleashed on all the inhabitants of the land, okay, the north is frequently. Um, the source of invasions for Israel. So when you look at where Israel is, maybe I could do this really quickly on a map. Um, I should have had another map pulled up, but that's okay. So you have Israel. Okay, you have the Dead Sea, the River Jordan, Sea of Galilee, and the north. 
Now down to the south, you have down here, you have, um, you have Egypt down here. This is the Nile River right there. You have Egypt down here and the Sinai Peninsula. And then you have up from the north, then you have the Euphrates and the, and the Tigris River. They join down there at the bottom. This area right here is desert, okay? No one's going to invade coming through the desert. You don't take an army and cross through the desert. You have to go around the desert. So invasions could come for Israel. You have Judah, Jerusalem right about there. You could have an invasion from Egypt coming up from the south. Or if you have Babylon or Assyria, the capital Nineveh, right up there. If they're going to attack, Babylon's not going to come straight across. They're going to go up the Euphrates and then come and invade southward. Okay? Same thing with Assyria. When Assyria invade, invaded, um, they came across this area, the region where Babylon and, and uh, Nineveh are, is called Mesopotamia. It's the land between the rivers, the Euphrates and the Tigris, and the Tigris River. So when they come to attack, and of course you're not going to get attacks from the, from the um, uh, west here because it is the Mediterranean. That's, that's waves, in case you're wondering. That's my attempt at waves. All right. Um, Back to the text. Here we go. All right, this is working pretty good. I like this. Okay, so now he says, out of the north, evil will be unleashed on all the inhabitants. So you're going to be invaded. They understood that that's, you know, evil, this evil is going to be unleashed. Behold, I'm calling all the families of the kingdoms of the north, declares the Lord, and they will come and place each one of them his throne at the entrance of the gates of Jerusalem. So they're going to come and they're going to set up their throne right outside your city. They're going to lay siege to you. And then we finally get down here. Um, the reason for this, whoops, over here. Verse 16, um, why is God watching over his word? Why is this you know, prediction of an invasion from the north coming? I will pronounce my judgments against them, verse 16, concerning all their wickedness since they have abandoned me and have offered sacrifices to other gods and worship the works of their own hands. Uh, the reason for the judgment? Idolatry. You remember, go back to... Um, I'll even I'll even pull it up here. What is the heart of covenant stipulations? Like the the law that God gave for His people. The heart of covenant stipulations is loyalty, exclusive loyalty to your suzerain, to your great king. And here we have uh, Exodus chapter twenty entering into this covenant. God spoke all these words, and He said, verse uh, verse two, "I am the Lord your God." That's the title to this, to this covenant who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, and there it is, the heart of it all. Not just simply no idols for the sake of no idols, but it is exclusive loyalty to God and God alone. You shall have no other gods before me. And right there, that's like, the, you transgress that, like, it's, it's over, for, for God's people. Now, he, of course, was patient, and, you know, he, this did not, this was not something like the first whiff of idolatry. Of course not. Um, Moses came down from the mountain, and they were already engaged in idolatry. When he was up getting the law, um, he had been patient for a long, long time. But in Jeremiah, it is not surprising that that is what we see here. Okay, let me scroll back down, verse 16. You know, he pronounces judgments because they've abandoned him you know, that relationship. God says, I knew you to Jeremiah. I had this, this like covenant relationship with you. Um, but now the people, do they know God? No, they know other gods. That's, that's what they know. Okay. And then this, these final words here to Jeremiah. Now, 
Belt your garment around your waist and arise. Speak to them all that I command you. Do not be dismayed before them, or I will make you dismayed before them. Wow. That's, um, you know, this threefold charge. You know, brace yourself. You know, the challenges are going to be hard. Don't be naive about this. Um, you're going to speak. Uh, and it's not just any message. You're going to speak the words that God commands. You know, that's what God's saying to Jeremiah. You're going to speak the words I'm commanding you. And then, um, I I like this this twisting, this turn of phrase here. Um, Do not be dismayed before them, or I will make you dismayed before them. Um, One commentator, John Thompson, uh, he put it this way. He said, "A uh, a man who fears man has also God to fear. Okay, don't be afraid of them, or I'm, <laughs> it's kind of like a parent. Uh, don't don't you cry, or I'll give you something to cry about. Um, don't be afraid of them, or I will really make you afraid. I mean, that is um, really strong, vivid. And then um, verse 18, Behold, I've made you today like a fortified city, like a pillar of iron. There's this image of military um, might and strength and protection. I've made you like a fortified city, not just like an open, you know, town with no walls or anything. But this is a city with walls and with with garrisons, with with soldiers guarding those walls, like a fortified city. Um, And like a pillar of iron, walls of bronze against the whole land, to the kings of Judah, to its leaders, to its priests, and to the people. Man, Jeremiah is going to be facing opposition from all these groups. Jeremiah is going to feel very isolated um, as he is trying to, you know, work out, you know, deliver the the words that God has given him. Uh, He's going to, you know, he needs to be fortified against kings. Uh, against its leaders, against its priests, against the people of the land. And verse 19 says, they will fight against you. Wow, that sounds like it's going to be a lot of fun. Not, um, you know, and you're going to be victorious. It's going to be great. And I'm going to, you know, it's more like get ready because brace yourself. All these people are going to come against you and they will fight against you. But... They will not overcome you, for I am with you to save you. So Jeremiah is going to face this bitter opposition, but ultimately he's not going to be overcome. Again, it's that reassurance, because I am with you. I am with you to save you. Wow. Um, I mean, this is echoing back to uh, Emmanuel, right? Um, I am with you to save you. I think it's really remarkable. So um, that's Jeremiah chapter one. Sorry, this took a bit longer than what I was expecting. Um, it's just very different lecturing with a uh, with a video and not having you like in a classroom with me. Uh, but I hope this was helpful. This is really our approach to the text. Not that I'm expecting for you to do like a detailed exegetical analysis of every single passage. But especially as you're looking towards your exegetical paper, this is the kind of thing. And really, I'm expecting you to go deeper than we even did here. You're really trying to pay close attention to details and really work it out. Okay? Um, I'll put this in another note in the class just to make sure. But as you're using, I don't have the... Oh, I do. So here's the commentary. Um... Jeremiah and Lamentations from the the Tyndale Old Testament commentaries. Uh, It's really good. Basically, what you're doing is as we're working through the text, you know, the title of each week, um, you should be reading along in the commentary, you know, and drawing some of these observations. So this is a good commentary. It's a great place to start. Of course, when you're doing your exegetical paper, you're going to be consulting a lot more resources than just that one. You'll be looking at a number of different commentaries along with articles and other things like that. But... um, Yeah, this was a lot of fun. Thank you.